appreciate y'all being here. Thank y'all. Uh, it's just good to be here. And out of the heat, we got the air conditioning running wide open. And uh, boy, it's just it's good to be in the house of the Lord. We've got a few announcements. Remember our Sunday school. Uh, let's get that back going and uh, strong again. And then come on out for that and just dig a little bit deeper in God's Word. And, and uh, praise the Lord for all the folks that are here doing the children's uh stuff in, in our adult class and also our Wednesday night Bible study uh, having a wonderful time with that and uh, in the book of Revelation and then tonight we're continuing our study on the book of Romans and we've been about three, two or three Sundays just going through the introduction and tonight we'll be in uh, the wrath of God against all ungodliness and unrighteousness and you don't want to miss that and uh, in fact for the next probably month or so we'll be dealing with that man's sin and God's wrath and your guilt and just a it's just a fascinating uh, two or three chapters there that you need to be aware of and, and really that whole book has been a blessing for me to go through it again and so I encourage you to come out on Sunday nights uh, for that and we've got Awanas and uh, for every age group and uh, so come on out uh, <coughs> Gail Vance and his family will be with us August the 9th looking forward to that and we've got VBS Still have the sign up sheet out there, so if you'd like to help us with that, we'd, we'd love to have you uh, help us and be here and support. And it's just a, uh, I'm just looking for a big Bible school. You never know uh, if people come or not. You just uh, be obedient to God and just put it in His hands. He'll bring those uh, right kids and those right families to our church and hear the Word of God. And so, also, September the 6th, I think it says on your. Uh, Bulletin, but that's uh, Sam called me. Needed to change that to the 13th. So September, the, it's not September the 6th. And we'll revise it next. Uh, but he just called me yesterday. So after we done did the bulletins, but it'll be uh, not September the 6th. But he'll be here September the 13th. And so looking forward to Brother Sam. If you've heard him, uh, and I have for years, he's just a, uh, just a wonderful preacher, and especially on the. Uh, being a Jew, it's just great on that Old Testament stuff and the feast. And, uh, it's just a blessing to hear him speak about it. And uh, also the Rochesters, uh, they'll be uh, here with us in October again to sing. And Scott will be here uh, a few extra days to hang around and preach for us. And we're looking for the, uh, forward to that. And also, the, it's not in here, but the third Sunday in August, we'll be getting our men's breakfast back home. Okay. Amen. All right. So uh, we'll just uh, put that in mind. So all you men come on out and we'll have. Uh, I don't know what all we'll have. I know we'll have some uh, chicken gizzards. We usually start out with that and go to the liver mush, which is Eric's favorite. But uh, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll work through all that. So you come on out and we'll just have a good time fellowshipping. Uh, it's good to get that back going. We had a lot of people coming to that. We need to get it back going. So there's a few announcements. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we just thank you. You're so good to us. And Lord, we just couldn't thank you enough uh, just for waking us up this morning, Lord, Father. And I pray you'd help us today, Lord, Father, as we go into your word, uh, as we can just gather around your throne this morning, Lord, and worship you and, and please you and, and everything done for your glory. And we'll just thank you and love you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you go ahead and stand, grab your hymn books, please, and turn to page 237. 237. Tell it to Jesus. One day's going to come and lead us.
sing and appreciate that. There's only one. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Jehovah of the Bible. So praise the Lord for that good singing. I believe uh, Forgiven has our offertory specials as they come up and get ready with their microphones and everything. And the ushers are ready to come down. We'll receive the morning tithes and offering.
relationship with you. And I was teaching the kids that they would have no better friend than Jesus. And so we started teaching them this song. And times that my kids by family. Kids singing, He knows my name. And that's what it's all about. As us as Christians, we need to be sharing the gospel. We need to be telling these kids they got a friend so much closer than a brother. And he does know my name. And just be their life because these kids need it.
dismissed for our children's church, ages three to six, and uh, our nurse are back there as well. So, appreciate all these little ones. What a blessing. Appreciate all the folks that help with that. I tell you, it takes a lot of work back there on Wednesday nights and Sundays. Mindful of that. Well, I'd like to take the word of God this morning. This morning, excuse me, I'm all choked up. Uh, chapter 17, we'll be in chapter 17. Uh, we've been uh, looking at our Lord's uh, final hours before the crucifixion. And uh, if you recall, we started back in, uh, really, chapter 13 uh, with uh, the disciples alone with Jesus in the upper room. Uh, he washes their feet. He begins to give them a lesson on humility and obedience. Uh, and then through the next chapters, 14, 15, and 16, we see Jesus teaching them about denying themselves. Uh, he promises of them the Holy Spirit of God that would come down and be a comfort to them. He tells them about His death uh, as He will uh, die on the cross and ascend back to heaven to the Father. Chapter 14, the very end of that chapter, Jesus arises from the table after He's initiated the Lord's Supper and He begins His uh, track to the Garden of Gethsemane. And along the way, He teaches them about the vine and the branches and about being fruitful. And, and we read all about that. In chapter 16, uh, He goes in depth even in greater detail about the spirit of truth and the, the one that would come to glorify Him, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. And we looked at the work of that Holy Spirit. And then He tells them as well during this time that if the world hated Him, it would, of course, hate them. And that they would be in much tribulation in this life. And then on top of all that, He gives them this command in chapter 16, verse 33, and he says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have, not that you might or maybe, or, but you shall have tribulation. And so uh, he gives them a, a, a word, a command here, if you will, but be of good cheer. Through all that, I want you to be happy. I want you to be satisfied. I want you to have peace, because I have overcome the world. Because in a little while I go away, but in a little while I will come again. And because of that, uh, we can be of good cheer. And so we've gone over a tremendous amount of stuff. If you jump over to verse uh, 1 in chapter 18, you'll notice that in chapter 18, when we get there, the Lord uh, goes over the Kidron, the brook of Kidron, and He uh, is there in the, the, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. And it's there where He'll... Fight his greatest battles with the, the devil. And, uh, he'll pray, and as it was, his sweat became great drops of blood that fell to the ground. He's really praying right there. But before all this, we come to chapter 17, and there's a few chapters in the Bible that I just, I'll just be honest with you, I can't do a whole lot with. I, I, I was telling my Brother Dave up here as the choir was about ready to sing that. Uh, there's just some chapters that are so supernatural, yeah. so mysterious, so holy, that when you get into them, you realize that you're just, just kind of like Moses at the burning bush, and you just kind of want to take your shoes off and kind of tread lightly in the presence of God. Uh, you get to Job chapter 1, you, there's just not much you can do with that. You get to Ezekiel chapter 1, uh, there's just, it's just tough as you wade into it. And then there's chapter 17 of John. and uh, So you pray for me. I, I don't know uh, exactly how much I can uh, express with words. When you look at John chapter 17, the Holy Spirit uh, takes time to record this complete prayer of our Lord and Savior. He stops and He prays out loud so that the disciples can hear Him and so that we can hear Him. It's the longest recorded prayer of Jesus. In fact, anywhere else in the Bible, we have a few words of Jesus. We have an inkling of His prayer life, but we don't have it recorded in the depths that we have it recorded here in chapter 17. Every word is His prayer to the Father. 
And it is God speaking to God. And uh, in, it, in and of itself, that, that's very mysterious. But it's the greatest, simply the greatest prayer uh, that's ever been prayed by the greatest man who ever lived. And he does it out loud and he records it by the Holy Spirit for us to glean from. We often call the Lord's Prayer, uh, uh, the Lord's Prayer that we all prayed when we used to play ball. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's, that's often called the Lord's Prayer, but that's not the Lord's Prayer. Uh, when we look back at Matthew chapter 6 and the Sermon of the Mount and he teaches his disciples how to pray, he gives them that prayer. And, uh, but that's not the Lord's prayer. The Lord would never pray that prayer. Uh, he never had to ask for forgiveness for his days. Uh, but he did give us a pattern to pray by. But here the Lord's true prayer is right here. And it is his uh, unveiling of his relationship to the Father. And yet He is God, the Son, and there's God, the Holy Spirit, and then there's God, the Father. If I ask you what the, uh, the Holy Spirit is, and you say, well, He's God. And I ask you who Jesus is, you say, well, He's God. And so it's very hard to put into words uh, when you see this, this very holy, precious prayer. And that Jesus speaks out loud. But he does speak it out loud, and I, I believe it's for our purpose. Now, I'm going to read uh, not all of it, but I'll, I'll break this down for you. The prayer is really in three parts. If you look at the first five verses, you'll see that Jesus prays for himself. After he prays for himself, he begins in, to pray in the next part, verse 6, all the way down through verse 19, he begins to pray for his disciples. His apostles, those uh, men that had received his word and had believed on him. Now, those prayers, uh, not only for the disciples, but they have application for us. But he's specifically praying for them. So you, you don't want to miss that. He, he's, he's not praying for the world. He's not necessarily praying specifically for us, although he is. But he's praying for those men. And then after that, the closing verses there, verse 20 through 26, he prays for the church that will be. And so it's very fascinating to look at each section of this prayer. And again, I just urge you to go home and just read this and, and just take it in. And uh, by my mind, as God pulls back the curtain, the veil, a spiritual veil, if you will, and let us see something very fascinating here. And let's just read the first, uh, we'll read the first uh, eight verses, and uh, then we'll just, uh, we'll just jump into it uh, with as much uh, reverence and prayer as we can muster this morning, and, and just to let God speak to us. Chapter 17, <coughs> Jesus is on his way to Gethsemane. The Bible tells us these words spake Jesus. Now these words connected with what he's just talking. So he's preached and taught them uh, from chapter 13 to chapter 16, and now uh, he's going to pray and bathe all that he's taught them in prayer. And lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal life. This is life eternal. That they might know thee, the only true God, in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou givest me to do. Now he's the only one that can pray that, isn't he? He's the only one that can glorify God. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thy own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Jesus has always been. His incarnation there in Bethlehem is not the beginning of Jesus Christ. There's never been a time when he's not been the Son. There's never been a time when he's not been Jesus. I would have manifested, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou givest me out of the world. That's to the disciples. Thine they were, and thou givest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. 
For I have given unto them the, the, the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I come out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Let's pray. Lord, I pray you'd help us. Lord, as we, we look at your word, Lord, this morning, as this great prayer, Lord, Father, as uh, the Son, the very God of God, is, is, is communicating with his heavenly Father. Uh, Lord, Father, I, I just pray you to, to you put your words in my mouth, Lord, Father, that you'd help me, Lord, Father, uh, that you'd open my heart to what you'd have us to, uh, to glean this morning, Lord, Father. And we'll just thank you and praise you for who you are. And we love you and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, we see these words that Jesus spoke here. And often this prayer is called the Lord's High Priestly Prayer. Because what, the, what we're seeing here is a glimpse of the Lord's eternal work on the throne of heaven. Even now, as we're here gathered this morning, there is a man in heaven. He's not cast for the ghost. He's, 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 he's not a spirit. He is a man... A glorified man. He is the God man. He sits on the throne of heaven beside the majesty on high. The Bible says in Hebrews 1.3 that he holds all things together by the word of his power. And now has sat down beside the majesty on high. He has nail scarred hands and nail scarred feet. He is the same Jesus that was crucified on that cross went down to the depths of earth and descended down in there and suffered your hell and my hell, your punishment that you deserved. He died not just for you, but as you. He ascended back up into that tomb and he grabbed a hold of his body. And the body was glorified. He left those clothes laying right there because he'd never need any more grave clothes. And now he sits in heaven. And his job in heaven is to make intercession for you to the Father. And that's what he does. In fact, that is his 24-hour, seven-day-a-week job is to intercede for you. He ever lives to intercede for you. Two verses in the Bible tell us what God is doing right now, what the Lord is doing for you. Verse 8, I mean, uh, chapter 8, verse 34 in Romans says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. He is our advocate. He is our lawyer, okay, up in heaven. We do not have to advocate for ourselves because we have nothing to advocate. Yeah. That's right. You have nothing to plead on your own merit. You are 100% guilty. But because we've trusted in Christ, we are proclaimed righteous before God. Think about that. Righteous means that, the word righteous means simply that you are right with God because of Jesus. He has made atonement for you at the cross of Calvary. That word at, atonement is simply spelled, it means exactly like it's spelled, at one mint. That means you have been made one with God through Jesus Christ. And He makes intercession for you. He advocates your cause. Look at uh, Hebrews 7.25. Wherefore He is able also to save them to the uttermost. Once He saves you, friend, you're saved. That's the uttermost. Okay? And so there's no chance of me ever becoming unsaved. Now that's not bragging on me. That's bragging on Him. Uh, I deserve hell. But because of Jesus and my faith that I put in Him and the grace that He has given me, there is no chance. I am 100% hell proof. That come on to God by Him seeing He ever liveth. Not that sometimes, not that He occasionally gets around to it, but that He ever liveth to make intercession for them. He's your advocate. Listen, when you go to a, a lawyer, and not that I've never need, ever needed a lawyer, but some of you probably have. Here's the first, listen, here's the first thing a lawyer's going to tell you. To do. And you ask, well, what do I do? He says, the lawyer will tell you, you do absolutely nothing. Once you give it over to your lawyer, you never say another word to anybody. What well, shouldn't I call them that? I'll take care of that. Shouldn't I write them up? 
you're not understanding. I'm your lawyer. The best thing that you can do, the only thing that you can do is keep your mouth shut. I am your advocate. I will do all the talking from here on out. Haven't you ever seen Matt Lock? <laughs> and no, I'm not Matt Lock. I know some of you got confused when I walked in this morning. <laughs> You let your lawyer take care of that. And Jesus takes care of all that for you. Yeah. Now what we have here is Jesus in his intercessory work that he's doing right now on your behalf. And the curtain is pulled back and he allows you to see what he is praying for you at this very moment. It's fascinating. And this all comes from the Old Testament illusion, not illusion, the Old Testament illustration shadow and type of the high priest in the Old Testament. His job was to represent God to man and represent man before God. And the Bible goes into great detail in the book of Hebrews about the work of the high priest. And Jesus has taken over that work that God gave to man because man cannot fully do it. He is a sinful creature himself and he had to make atonement for himself and then he would make atonement for the people and he would do that once a year on the day of atonement. And that would cover the people and that would cover the sin until the next year and it would have to be done again. And then daily, on day after day, individuals would have to come up and they would have to shed the blood of an animal because without the shedding of blood, there's no remissions, there's no forgiveness of sin. And so what they would do is they would shed that blood on the altar and then once, uh, and they would sprinkle it upon the altar. But that once a year, there was a special day, that day of atonement, when only this high priest would go in to speak to God and make atonement for the people. He was the high priest. The very first one was Aaron. And we'll talk about this. Let's, let's look at Hebrews 9, uh, verse 1. And, and it's a lot of reading, but you need to understand this. You're not fully going to understand what's going on here in chapter 17 as we look at the high priest, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the high priest, as he's doing the work of the eternal high priest. He's taken away the Old Testament for us, and now he's ushered in the New Testament. Remember, he took away the Passover and replaced it with what? The Lord's Supper. Amen? Amen. So now we, he, he is the, the Passover. And so this, this can be very confused, especially if you, you've not been saved long or, you, you, uh, or you, you're growing in the Lord. So let me, let me try to do my best. I told this this. This, this is stuff is, is we'll try to glean some stuff. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 115. This is Apostle Paul talking about some of the stuff uh, about this high priest and his work in the Old Testament and how that compares to Jesus' work of intercession in the New Testament. All right, chapter 9. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinance of divine service in a worldly sanctuary. He's talking about the tabernacle now in the wilderness that... Uh, uh, the, the Israelites erected there after they were freed from Egypt. And they wandered in the wilderness. They, they took that tabernacle with them. For there was a tabernacle made. The first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Okay? This is important. The high priest... Uh, there was only one person that could go in behind that veil, okay? Now, many of the priests would come into the first sanctuary. You had the candlestick, which spoke of the only light in the whole place. You had the, the showbread on their right, which spoke of fellowship around the table. And we've already seen Jesus in the Gospel of John telling us that he is all those things, okay? The light of the world, the only light, there it is. The, I am the bread of life, the showbread, partook by the priest. The Bible says that we are a priestly generation. We are a priesthood of believers. And so we fellowship on the bread. We have the light. All this speaks of Christ. And then right before that veil was the altar of incense. 
where they would burn. And the Bible says that a sweet savor, a smell would rise up to the God of heaven and it pleased Him when He would smell that savor. Now that speaks of the prayers today that go up to our Lord and Savior and it pleases Him when we pray to Him. So everything in that first sanctuary speaks of Jesus. And so that priest would go in there and he would do his service for the Lord. But then there was a veil there. And that, you know, we, we picture that as maybe just a sheet. But that veil was many inches thick. Some of the, the writers in the Hebrews say that veil was six inches thick of the toughest hide and leather that they could find. Almost impossible to put a tear in. And so this is the scene that the Hebrew writers talking about. And he says, inside the holiest of all, where the high priest would go, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid round about with golden worm, was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. God's presence was in one place right there. He would abode in the holiest of all on that day of atonement, right there on what the Bible calls the mercy seat. And on the side of those mercy seat was those cherubims. And you may have seen a picture of it. And on below, what the mercy seat sat on was what they called the Ark of the Covenant. You know that thing Indiana Jones tried to find in the first movie. Now, inside that Ark was the law, the two covenants, the two tables of the law, the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod that had budded, the dead rod that had come back to life. You with me on that? So we have the law that was broken by us, but that was completely fulfilled by Jesus Christ. We have a dead stick that was dead, but now is alive again. Okay? And then we have a jar, a golden censer full of manna inside that Ark of the Covenant. The bread of life. And now what the Bible tells us is, if we were to read back in... Leviticus chapter 16. And if you read back, and I you probably had that for your devotion this morning, Leviticus. Leviticus 16, Leviticus chapter 23. And if you would have read in Exodus 28 this morning, and I know most of us did because we were preparing for John 17. <laughs> and you put that all together, you get the you you get the process of what took on on that day of atonement. Okay, and this allowed for the atonement of man, and this is the intercession that Jesus foreshadowed and fulfilled. And that's why this prayer is so holy to hear him and what he is talking to God about, about you and I this very moment. Now let me let me finish the, the type here so you'll know what's going on. The high priest would come on that day. And he would, take, uh, he would take his garments off. You remember his holy garments? He had a turban that said, Holiness unto the Lord. He had uh, the names of all the tribes on his shoulder. And then he had Israel's names. Had them right here on his heart. And he carried those around everywhere he went. And on the Day of Atonement, he would take all that off. And he would just put on one white linen garment. And he would prepare himself to enter into this holy of holies. Can you imagine the fear of that day? Mm -hmm. If Aaron don't get this right, he's not coming out alive. If Aaron doesn't get this right, we're not atoned and we're in big trouble. And so two million people are waiting outside this tabernacle and they're gathered around and they're praying and they're sweating and they're wringing their hands and they're saying, Aaron, don't let us down. We need you today. What a day it was, the most solemn day of the year for these folks. And so what he does is he goes over here and he has one of the priests bring him two goats. Two goats. And one goat is going to be used for the blood. One goat he's going to slay. One goat he's going to kill on the brazen altar. One goat he's going to take that blood and he's going to march in. Uh, and reverence and humility and he's going to go into the holiest of all where no man can tread. In fact, no man has ever been in there 
but the high priest. He's the only one that can go. The second goat, he lays his hands on him and confesses the sins of a nation on that goat. And he transfers by the laying of his hands all that sin on that one goat. And then the Bible says a very fit man comes along and takes this goat and takes him out into the deepest wilderness that he can find, leaves him out there, and they never see that goat again. In other words, every sin that was placed on that goat is taken so far away you might say it was taken as far away as the east is from the west. Yeah. It would almost be like taking your sins and casting them into the depths of the sea. Yeah. Well, one of you is with me. Yeah. But anyway, that goat is never seen again. Those sins are to be remembered no more. But then he has this goat over here. And he takes that blood. And he comes in behind this veil. Okay? Okay? And in a few days, there'll be some blood that will be shed and there'll be a veil on earth that will be rent from top to bottom. Amen. And the veil will be taken away that all those who trust in Christ can now enter in to the holiest of all through Jesus Christ where no man could enter in before. Well, he's been at this all day as a high priest. And now he's got the blood, and he's fixing it. He, he's shaking a little bit. Can you imagine what was going through Aaron's mind when he had that sensor of blood going in there to that place where God Himself was? And if he messed up, and if he ruined this thing, all those people were counting on him. And he goes back there, and he begins to sprinkle the blood. Because God said, don't come back here without the blood. <laughs> if you come out here without the blood, you're not leaving here. And he begins to sprinkle that blood. And he begins to make atonement for the people. And he sprinkles it on the mercy seat. And God accepts that blood. And Aaron's not struck down dead. And Aaron backs up out of there. All so slow. Then he goes by the brazen laver there with the water in it and he begins to clean himself from all that blood. And he takes off those clothes that he had on. And here's, here, here's what they're all waiting for. They're all out there waiting. He puts on back his royal garments. Now why is that important? I'm about to get this. I've been wanting to, that's what I've been wanting to get to all morning. Over in Exodus 28, you don't have to turn there. But the Bible makes mention of this royal garment that the high priest is wearing. It's very fascinating. I love to talk about it. And he says in verse 31 of Exodus 28, speaking of this garment that Aaron is about to put back on, and thou shalt make the robe of the ephod all of blue, and there it shall be, <clears throat> and hole in the top of it, in the midst thereof, and it shall have a binding of woven work round about the whole of it, as it were the whole of a harbinger that is that is to be not rent. And beneath upon the hem, this is the hem of this garment, it, it thou shalt make pomegranates of blue and of purple. You've seen them in the store, and you've ate some of those. Everybody knows what a pomegranate is, right? And it's the fruit thereof. And of a purple and a scarlet round about the hem thereof. And notice what it says here. And bales of gold between them round about. And golden bale and a pomegranate, a golden bale and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe round about. And it shall be upon Aaron to minister, and his sound shall be heard when he goeth in unto the holy place before the Lord. And when he cometh out, that he die not. When Aaron comes and he puts those holy garments back on, and he's made it out. Woo! He's struck. Why he's struck? You know what's going on? Ring the ring, ring the The bells are ringing. And everybody outside said, He's done it! Aaron's made it through! We're a told we're going to live for another year because our high priest has sprinkled the blood and we found atonement today and forgiveness. And I'm telling you, there's one high priest when he shed his blood and they stripped him of his garment. He came back and put a royal garment of flesh on and the veil has been ripped from the top to the bottom. And you can now go into the very presence of God. How about that? For a high priest. And now, Jesus is praying.
praying. And first of all, he prays for his time. That's what he says here. So we go back to John 17. Boy, I can, woo, I'm getting excited. Come on, bring He's our high priest. Praise his holy name. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. I want to tell you, the cross was not an afterthought. God didn't look down and see Adam and say, Oh, I didn't think he was going to do that. Now what am I going to do? But somewhere in eternity past, God always knew. Right, big cow. The son always knew that there was an hour where he would hang on that cross yeah. and die and bleed for you. He always knew that. And when God saw that in the, the, the fullness of time was come, Galatians 4, 4 says, when the fullness of time was come, not a minute before, not a minute after, God sent forth His Son made of a woman made under the law. The hour was not an accident. And Jesus said, I've come to my hour. Remember back when we started in the Gospel of John? And he was going to turn water into wine. Now some of y'all know that verse. You've said it all the time. You're popping a beer open and somebody quote a scripture to you and say, hey, leave me alone. Jesus turned water into wine. And his mom come to him and said, we've got no... We've got no wine. He said, woman, what have I to do with you? My hour is not yet coming. And all through the Gospel of John, he says, my hour is not yet coming. They tried to lay hands on him and kill him, but the Bible says he went away because his hour is not yet coming. Jesus lived his whole life for that one purpose. That hour. That's all he ever was concerned about because the hour was the glory that he was going to give his father. Right. It was the joy. Hebrews said it was the joy. That he considered it the joy to go to that cross. That was set before him. Endured the cross. Despising the shame. Think about that. Our idea of glory sometimes is a little different from what the idea Jesus had in mind when he was on this earth. It's interesting that in chapter 12 is where we first saw that the hour had come. All through there, the hour had come, the hour had come. And in chapter 12, it's interesting that when the Gentiles, remember that? There's a group of Greeks come and told Philip, and Philip told Andrew, and Andrew told Jesus, and there were some Greeks there, and they said, you know what, we would see Jesus. In other words, the Gentiles began to search out this Jesus, and Jesus said, well, that's about I believe, if I, I believe I hear the Father saying it's about that time. And this hour was first predicted word. Genesis chapter 3. You think this Bible is not real? You can trust your Bible. 4,000 years ago, here's what God said about the whole thing. Let's see if I can find it here for you. It's fascinating. And I will put enmity between, this verse 15, chapter 3, between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That's the first mention of the gospel. Let me read that again to you. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. I'll tell you, on the cross, Satan's head was bruised. He was totally destroyed. Amen. That's the first mention of this hour. It's interesting. Interesting verse. Jesus got this thing together, and the cross was the hour that all eternity rests on. Past and future came together right there at the cross. In fact, Paul said, God forbid that I would glory in anything save the cross of Jesus Christ. But now notice his task. I like what he says here when he's praying for himself. He says, I have glorified thee on earth. 
I have finished the work which thou givest me to do. Have you ever seen so many things in church that are started and not finished? Can't stand it. Can't stand it. I only like to start. If I can't finish it, I don't want to start it. I just, I, there's just so many things that get started and they, they weigh out and it's that way in our lives uh, so often. There's so many things that we start that we just don't finish well on. Oh, we get excited when we get saved. We're in church every Sunday. We're singing in the choir. We're, we're working in everything and then two or three years later it's over with. Jesus finished everything He started. Look at all the things He said He'd done. He said, I have glorified thee on earth, and I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Does your life glorify him in the least bit? Have you finished what you started? I, it's, just, it's, just a, it's just a disease that's spread in all our lives. We, just, we don't want to procrastinate. We don't want to finish what we started. We don't want to commit to do anything for God. We want to just kind of soak up all the blessing without any responsibility. Well, fine. I'll move on. That ain't hit my much this morning. He says, not only have I glorified thee and I have finished, but notice what else he done. He said, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou givest me. I've made it apparent. I've revealed Christ to these men. I wonder how many of us could say that, that we've done that this week. That's what else he says. We didn't read this verse, but in 14, he says, I've given them thy word. I've given them thy word. Jesus did a lot of things here on earth. And he was about to do even more. Not only was his time at hand, not only is his task finished as he prays these first few verses, but notice his treasure. I like this one. This one, my favorite one. I'll, I'll close with this. It's interesting to note how many times that Jesus, that there was that that there was a gift given to the Son by the Father. Now, follow me on this. Verse two. And this is odd because we don't think about this because what God's doing here, in fact, seven times he, he gives he, he gives the Son a gift. Now that's unusual. That, that the one that created all things and was created for Him, he has He hung the earth out on nothing. Doesn't think He needs anything or would need a gift. But we're going to see that He gets a gift, and it's mentioned seven times. We don't think about that because John three sixteen tells us that. Jesus is the gift to you and to me and to a lost and dying world. He's the gift. But in this prayer, verse 2 says, As thou hast given him power of all the flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou, as many as the Father has given him. Verse 6, Thou givest them me. Verse 9, Which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Verse 11. Thou hast given me that me, that they may be one as we are. If I can stop right there. That's what I thought I was going to finish up here. But just, just. You know what Christ is praying for in the church? Unity. Right. I pray for it. That's what I pray for. I hardly, I hardly ever get down on my knees praying for this church when I don't pray unity. Sir. Listen. This, that, is the, that is the most destructive thing of any growing church is disunity. Yeah. And it's because your focus gets off of God and it gets on you. Go ahead. Now listen to me. A lamb never bothers another lamb. A lamb's not... He looks over and sees another lamb beside him. He's not fear. He's not worried about that. Come on, you know what I mean? Only a wolf bothers the lamb. Let me move on. Verse 12. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. Praise the Lord. Don't you think that if Jesus prays that everything he prays, the Father's going to answer yes? <laughs> Come on, man. I'll tell you, this is good stuff. Verse 24. Who now has given me? 
God the Father gave you the greatest gift that there could ever be. He gave His Son for you. And in turn, the Father gave the greatest gift to His Son that His Son could ever receive, and that's you. And seven times in that one prayer, He says, Father, look what you've given me. Look what you, I mean, he is thankful seven times here that God gave me to Jesus as a gift through faith. I trusted him. And now I belong to him. And, and the Lord in his high priestly prayer of intercession says, I want to thank you for that one right there. The God who slung the world and the stars and the galaxies that you can't even fathom out on nothing, who runs everything on a perfect timetable, the sun is never where it's not supposed to be, the earth is never where it's supposed not to be, there is nothing that doesn't run because of the word of His power it keeps it all together, and yet it was precious to this son, it was precious to the one who every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. It means something to him to have you. The question is, what does it mean for you to have him? Andy, come on up here. I believe we're on number 476. As we stand, please, and turn to number 476. Is it all on the altar? As Andy leads us a couple verses. I don't know what you're going through this morning. I felt very heavy uh, as we were singing those songs, which I usually don't do. Uh, and somebody's spirit may be bearing witness to my spirit. I, I don't know what you come in with or, or what you feel like this morning, but I'm telling you, when God opened his mouth to God, he said seven times, it's mighty good that you've given that person to me. And I'm telling you, you can be a good cheer this morning knowing that you're very special to the Lord in heaven this morning. I don't know what you need or who's suffering what or maybe you're down in the dumps a little bit or maybe you, you've gotten all fearful. You looked at the out there and, and uh, all this mess going on. Listen, the world does what it does. Yeah. Yeah. That's just what the world is. It means they, they've never been any different. But I'm telling you, you're somebody in Jesus Christ. Maybe you don't know Him as your high priest. You've never been on the other side of that veil. <laughs> where no man can go alone. But I'll tell you, it's mighty nice over there on the other side of the veil. Listen, there's the hour, and you're either on this side of Calvary or you're on the eternal side of Calvary. Maybe you need Jesus this morning. Whatever you need, as we sing. You have longed for sweet peace and for faith.